Hello, I'm Julia Fisher and you're listening to The Olive Tree, the program that brings you firsthand the stories of believers living in the Holy Land to help us understand what God is doing there today. The previous two programs were based in Bethlehem in the West Bank. Today I'm travelling to Beersheba, a desert city in southern Israel, to meet Joachim Figueres, who is the pastor of a small messianic congregation in Arad, a town just a few miles east of Beersheba, that is predominantly inhabited by religious ultra-Orthodox Jews. You are about to hear the story of a spiritual struggle that has overspilled into the harsh realities of everyday life. Joachim and his wife Debbie have six young children. Joachim's story is unusual in that his father, who was Spanish, used to be a monk, as you will now hear. My father was a monk, and at some stage he understood he cannot be the representer of all the views of the Catholic Church, so he left the monastery with the agreement of the monastery. My mother comes from a Protestant Dutch family that was also very much involved in the Dutch underground in Holland and they personally were hiding a Jewish friend, a Jewish lady in their house and they really saw the establishment of the State of Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecies so they were very Zionistic. That's my mother's background that brought her to Israel so she met with my dad. And your wife equally has an unusual story. Her mother is a a Jewish lady from London, actually, yeah. and her father was a Jew from Iraq, I believe. Yeah, her father was born in Japan, actually, to make things more complicated, <laughs> but uh, to an Iraqi Jewish father, <laughs> I won't make it complete- complicated about the mother. <laughs> anyway, yeah, basically an Iraqi business family, very rich family, he was brought up in English posh boarding schools in India and Egypt, and uh, later on also in Switzerland and ended up in London after the Iraqis, uh, because of him being Jewish, cancelling his uh, Iraqi citizenship, so the British granted him with British citizenship. His wife, my mother-in-law, was born in London to a Jewish family, partly from uh, Russian origin. Jews were wandering all around the world after the pogroms in uh, Russia at the beginning of uh, the previous century they found themselves in England yeah and as a Jew she came to faith as a young child I I believe in a Christian English school and she found her Lord and Savior and her rest and she never left this uh, faith but when she grew she as a Jewish believer found a Jewish man, believer also in Jesus, and uh, together they decided to uh, raise a family. They went first to Italy (laughs) to tell the Jews in Italy about their Messiah, and then afterwards they made Aliyah and and made their base in Nahariya. It's quite amazing how your stories all come together. But here you are now, as you say, you're living in Arad, but you were a social worker for many years here in Beersheba, where where we're speaking. But uh, you moved out, you have six children, and you have started this congregation in Arad, but it's not been easy, has it? It hasn't been very easy, but uh, we certainly felt the the Lord's hand all through the way. We didn't come with a plan to start a congregation, but it just so happened that uh, we were used by God. He planted us here in Arad, and uh, we started with a small house group that grew and expanded to a larger group, which is now the Arad Hebrew-speaking congregation. And you you, you mentioned that it hasn't been easy. This is the sixth year now that religious, ultra-Orthodox Jews are trying to give us problems by demonstrating outside of our homes, outside of the congregation, intimidating words. Uh, Of course, they feel that they have to protect the Jewish nation from uh, a spiritual disaster. They think that if a Jewish person believes in Jesus, in their mind, God forbid, you know, know, we, we know it's Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and he's the light of the world and he is the the answer to humankind. Jesus came first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. But they don't see it like we understand and know. They see it as a very big threat to the Jewish nation, even though, you know, we're not that many people in the congregation and even less Jews as part of the congregation. But only the fact that there are Jews believing in Jesus (laughs) 
really intimidates them and they feel they have to protect, they have to do something to save those people, save the Jewish uh, nation. But we pray for them. Six years is a long time to put up with that sort of intimidation. Can I ask how you cope with it, how you pray for these people, what you're expecting the outcome to be? Which way is it going? When John and James, the sons of thunder, wanted to ask the Lord if he allows them to ask God to throw fire on the Samaritan village that, that uh, didn't accept Jesus. That's what they felt, and that was actually their flesh. And Jesus rebuked them, and he said to them, you don't know of which spirit you are. The Son of Man did not come to condemn people you know, to death, but to save them. You know, not exact words, perhaps. And that's what I want to take for ourselves. John and James learned such a lesson when afterwards it was them that were sent to the Samaritans, the ones that they wanted to throw fire from heaven, and they prayed for the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the change that they went through. And then John writes so much about love and what he learned from Jesus himself about love, what it is to love, what it is to serve. That's what we want for ourselves. We understand it's a spiritual battle. We are very much aware of our flesh, you know, that wants to retaliate, that, you know, if people say bad words to you or if people just mock your children, you know, call them uh, cockeyed or, uh, you know, if, if, if people just, you know, mock your outward appearance, you know, if there's someone who is a bit uh, heavy, you know, a bit fat, they would just laugh at, at, at people's appearance. You know, they would mock a woman that has cancer. Terrible things, you know, and it raises extreme anger within you. And you want just to shout at them, you know, to sometimes they need to, to hear, you know, what is the truth. But we need to be so much aware of the spiritual battle that's going on here. And the, the, really, I mean, we talk about spiritual matters. We know the devil doesn't want the Jewish people to know their own Messiah. We know that the devil wants us to be full of hatred towards him. But that's not what Jesus taught John and James concerning the Samaritans that did not accept Jesus. Uh, he told them, you don't know which spirit you're from. So we want, and we're trying, and we're praying that God will fill us with his Holy Spirit all the time, that all our reactions would always be full of love, doesn't mean that it needs to be lacking the truth. Sometimes people need to hear the truth. But the main thing is to be full of love towards these people and not to go down to the level of argumentations, which they don't really bring argumentations, you know, not to go down to this level of uh, conversation, just mostly is just to be silent and to continue onwards. You know, in this case, with particularly these people, we learned that the best is mostly to be just to be silent and and to go to go on with life, to go on with the services on, on Shabbat mornings or to go on with our family life when they stand outside and, and shout and, and mock. Because we really understand that the only gospel most probably that those people will ever hear is is the way we would react to their to their really provocations. They want to see us stumble. They come um, uh, not on Saturdays, but in any other day of the week, they would come with the uh, cameras and video cameras and, and, you know, say the worst words just to hear us say anything negative and, you know, to have us on a video camera, or, you know, things like that. And say, ah, you see those dangerous people, you see their behavior. So we really, we know that we are being watched like under a microscope. It's, they, they watch every move of us, every step. My prayer for us is that when those people will come to know their Messiah, who is their Jewish Messiah, he's their brother, it's like Joseph with his brothers. The moment when they sold him to the Egyptians, they almost killed him. Instead, they threw him to the pit and sold him to the Egyptians. He became completely foreign to them. They did not recognize him as their brother. He became second to the ruler of the earth in those days. and. 
they could not believe that this one who became the savior of the world in those days would be their brother. And then at some point he said he wanted every Egyptian, every real foreigner to be out and he wanted to have something very intimate with his brothers. And he said, I'm Joseph, your brother. So we're waiting for that moment. <clears throat> we're expecting to see that moment. God willing in our days, at least in those people, and we pray that we would not be a stumbling block for them to see their brother, to see their Messiah, to see their Savior. When they come to faith in their Messiah, we don't want them to say to us, you were a stumbling block for us to come to know Yeshua. Contrary to that, we want them to say, it was amazing to look at you. It was, you were our example. You were the light that showed us the way to our Messiah. That's what we pray to God, you know, to give us strength to win the spiritual battle, to overcome the flesh, and to have patience and see that day coming. Joachim Figueres, father of six young children and pastor of a Messianic congregation in Arad in southern Israel. You're listening to The Olive Tree with me, Julia Fisher. Every program in this series features the story of a believer living in Israel or the Palestinian territories today. The aim of the programs is to find answers to one simple question. What is God doing in Israel today? And I think Joachim's story illustrates this well. So can I encourage you to respond? The Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund is a small charity based in the UK that seeks to prayerfully and financially support needy believers living in Israel and the Palestinian areas. We produce a bi-monthly newsletter and take tours to Israel to meet some of the people you hear on this program. So if you'd like to know more, then please get in touch. You can find information and articles on our website, www.olivetreefund.org, where you can also leave a donation. Or you can write to me, Julia Fisher, at the Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund, P.O. Box 850, Horsham, RH12, 9GA, in the UK. Thank you for your company today. I'll be back at the same time next week with more news and stories from the Holy Land. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.